Please turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55. I want to take a quick minute to embarrass Robert since he was just up here. And I just want to say how much I appreciate Robert and Sharice. They do so much around our church and are so faithful here. Robert serves as a deacon. He works in the sound room and does a lot in there. He does a lot around here behind the scenes. He, uh, Robert takes days off work just to come work at our church building and do maintenance stuff. And he's a willing servant. He has a great attitude. And I'm just so thankful for Robert and Sharice and all they do. And Sharice does a lot here as well. And so thank you, Robert. That is an example of somebody who said, Pastor, I don't really want to do it, but I'm willing if you want me to. And you know what? God rewards that right there is a willing spirit. My dad always said, the best ability is availability. And I think that's true. And Robert's got a good voice. He's got a good voice. So he did a great job. Thank you so much, Robert. That was a blessing. All right, let's look at Isaiah chapter 55. Oh, one more thing about Robert. Robert works, he's a diesel mechanic for a company up in Tecancha. And in the fall, they contract with a company to haul tomatoes with trucks. And so once the tomatoes are ripe, Robert starts working uber, uber extra overtime. So in about two weeks, you won't see him around here until mid-October. So pray for him as he's working long hours. And uh, Sharice is, a, is a, a, a single person at home for about two months. And Robert works really hard. So pray for him during that time. And we look forward to him returning. All right, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 55 tonight. This is... A wonderful chapter in the book of Isaiah, and I am so looking forward to preaching through it. There's so much here, we're going to break this into two parts, but I do want to read the full chapter tonight, any of those kind of long, and then we'll take about half of it this evening. So let's read from Isaiah 55. It says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, Come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me. Eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and the nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and snow from heaven returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into seeking, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord... For a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless his word tonight. Father, thank you for this prophecy from Isaiah. Lord, you, this whole chapter is an invitation to you. An invitation for us to seek you, to know you. 
to taste and see that you are good. Father, you are graciously calling to us to come to you, both in salvation, but also daily dependence and relationship. Lord, use this passage in our hearts tonight and next week. Lord, thank you for your word. Drive it down deep in our hearts, Father. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. I've entitled tonight's message, An Invitation to a Thirsty Soul. An Invitation to a Thirsty Soul. This is part one. We'll have part two next week. This is a wonderful chapter that I love in which God calls to all his people to seek him and enter into relationship with him. This chapter is full of beautiful truth about God, and uh, I can't fit all this into one message. That's why it's going to be two parts. But if you've been reading along in your Bible reading, and I hope many of you, I know many of you have, and I hope uh, many of you are reading along as we journey through Scripture together. Um, we've been reading a lot in Isaiah of judgment, haven't we? We talked about that last week. There is a lot of judgment in Isaiah. And that is because Judah and Israel have both sinned greatly. And God is, through Isaiah, warning them that judgment is coming. And, and that's, that's not a happy message. That's not a, a joyful. They weren't like, oh, here's Isaiah coming to bring us the joyful message. No, it wasn't that way. When Isaiah came, they were probably like, oh boy, here we go again. I'm sure it wasn't a thrilling thing because the bulk of Isaiah's prophecies are God is going to judge you. He's going to exile you. He's going to punish you for your sin. And yet sprinkled into that judgment are chapters like this. Chapters where in the midst of of warning of judgment, God is inviting, inviting these people to seek him. I want us to look, we're going to look at verses 1 through 7 tonight, and I want us to see if you're taking notes this evening, three reasons you should seek God. Three reasons you should seek God. Let's look at these things. Number one tonight, I want us to see God offers satisfaction that you cannot get anywhere else. God offers satisfaction that you cannot get anywhere else. Turn back and look at verses 1 and 2. It says, ho. Now, we don't say that anymore. That we think, I think of a horse when I hear that, don't you? The idea is stop. It's, a, it's an attention term here. It's, hey, hey, everyone that thirsteth. Come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but that's a lot, right? A lot of us, no money. Come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk. But this is special. It's, you can buy it without money and without price. Wherefore, or in other words, why? Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me. Eat ye that which is good. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. What God is saying here. And I know there's a lot of symbolic kind of flowery language God is using here. But he's saying here. He's calling an invitation for us to seek him. But he's, he's mentioning a great irony in this passage. Did you notice that? He says, so many people are spending money on things that do not satisfy. They are trying to get things to give satisfaction that do not give satisfaction. And yet what he is saying here is I'm offering what can give you satisfaction, but you cannot buy it. What a great irony that is, that we spend time and energy and money trying to get things that satisfy us. We spend our resources on things trying to satisfy our soul. And yet God is saying here, that will never, never satisfy you. But what I offer that will satisfy you, you cannot buy. There is no cost. It is relationship with God. God begins this passage by describing the thirsty or calling to the thirsty. Isn't thirst one of the strongest feelings when you're thirsty? I'm hungry is one thing. I, I'm hungry all the time, it seems. But when you're, have you ever been really, really thirsty? I got to share a story with you. You may not like this story, but 
One time I was working with a man who owned a property, and we were doing work on his property, and it was like an hour drive from the house, and we were far from anything, and we were cutting wood in, in August. And so we drive up to his property, and I brought six bottles of water, and I thought, that will be plenty. Well, that might have been plenty, but he brought zero water. And so we're sitting there cutting wood in the summer heat with chainsaws, and we're sweating, and we're just chugging that water. And after about an hour and a half, it's gone. And we should have got in his truck and drove into town and bought some more water. But he had a little stream right there going through his property. And he said, this is a cold spring-fed stream. We can drink out of this. And we were thirsty. And I thought, oh. I don't know. My dad always told me, you got to be careful about drinking that water. But as the day went on, I was resisting, and he was just over there drinking that stream water. And he was drinking, and I was so thirsty, and I gave in. And I got a parasite called Giardia, and I was sick for about, what, six days of torture. And I knew better. I knew, I thought, you're not supposed to drink stream water unless you've boiled it or purified it. I knew better. But in that heat, I was so thirsty. And isn't that thirst such an intense feeling? That thirst that we most all of us can relate with is the, is the imagery that God is using here. But it's not talking about a physical thirst. He's talking about a spiritual thirst. God knows that all human beings have a spiritual thirst. We desire relationship with God. We desire relationship with something that transcends earth. We, we, des- we thirst for purpose, for meaning, for hope, for peace, for satisfaction, for happiness. This passage, God is telling us tonight, and he was telling Israel then through Isaiah, that only those things can be found in him. C.S. Lewis, the author, said, If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. I think that's good. Our spiritual thirst can only be fulfilled in God when we truly seek him. We can find great joy and peace and purpose. Notice the end of verse 2 there. It says... Eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. This is not saying, put on, this, you know, this is not the Baptist anthem verse here about put on some pounds at the potluck and then embrace that. That's not what, it, this is symbolic here. It's talking about abundance. It's talking about when we seek God, he gives to us, and it, he gives to us, and we can enjoy that. We can have that satisfaction we're looking for, and we can rejoice in that. Thirst, our spiritual thirst is quenched and God gives fulfillment that can be delighted in. Don't you want that? Don't you want to rest in, in, in God and have delight and, and satisfaction in him? He offers that to us. And yet, don't we constantly, and let's be honest, let's just be honest tonight. Don't we as Christians constantly be looking for that joy and satisfaction elsewhere? I, maybe I'm the only one, maybe you don't, but I am constantly, my flesh is trying to find it in other places. And God is reminding us that he is the only one that offers it. And we get that by seeking him. You may say, Pastor Isaac, I'm already saved. I already sought God and he saved me. Praise the Lord. That is great. But what we're seeing here is, is not just a salvation seeking. This is a daily dependence, a daily relationship, a daily communion with God that brings joy and peace and satisfaction. Unfortunately, so many Christians who are truly saved are also miserable. And it doesn't mean they're not saved, but it means that they're they're not walking in, in that fellowship with God. And I'm not, I'm not saying tonight that if you're suffering a season of suffering in your life, you're not right with God. That's not biblical. I'm thankful tonight that God goes with us through suffering, doesn't he? I'm not talking about seasons or incidences of your life. I'm talking about the pattern of your life. Is the pattern of your life walking with God and resting in his goodness? 
Or is the pattern of your life doing things on your own, seeking your own will, and then going to God when things get bad? Going to God to bail you out. What God is calling to all people in this passage is a relationship with him. And that is why tonight I want to encourage you to seek God is because he is offering satisfaction to you that you cannot get anywhere else. So, so often as Christians, especially young people, we see the shininess of sin and popularity and wealth. And yet if you really pull back the curtain, there's a reason that so many people in Hollywood are addicted to drugs and die from suicide or overdose. There's a reason that the CEOs, the billionaires in our country, so many of them are, are living through terrible things and struggling also with addiction and all those things because no amount of money, no amount of fame, no amount of any of those can bring the satisfaction that every one of us is thirsty for. It is only found in a walk with the Lord. That is why you should seek God because he is offering satisfaction that you cannot get anywhere else. Let's look at the second point this evening. Number two, God stands ready to enter into relationship with you. Look back at verses three through six. It says, incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Now these next few verses are a little confusing, but he's, he's talking about his character as represented in his relationship with David. He says, verse 4, Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and the nations that knew thee not shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. What God is saying here is he's bringing up David and he's saying, of course, he's talking to Israel right here, right? Israel or Judah, one or, one or both. And he's saying, look at David. Look at the sure mercies of David. God used David in great ways. David sinned greatly. God still forgave him and still used him. He's saying, just as I made a relationship and a covenant with David, I will make that with you. It doesn't mean you're going to be king of Israel. It's not talking about David. We're focusing on the God's willingness to bless. God's desire to make covenant, to, to show mercy, to love. And of course, in verse 6, he's imploring us to seek him while he may be found, while he is near. I want you to realize tonight, God right now is standing ready for a closer relationship with you. You don't have to wait for a sign. You don't have to wait for him to wave a flag and say, hey, I want you. He is standing ready right now in relationship. That's why it says, call him right now while he's near. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed we're going to make it the rest of the day. But right now, you're here, you're alive, and God is calling for close relationship with you. That window will not last forever. You will die, and your opportunity to seek him while on this earth will be over. God is standing ready now. I've got a neighbor down the road. He's a friend of mine. He's a farmer. And the last few weeks, I've been driving by and stopping into his house to try to talk to him. And I bet you I've stopped six or seven times, and he is never home when I stop there. And then... Every time I'm in a hurry, because I drive right by his house to come to church, as soon as I get in a hurry to get to church, I'm driving and I look and his truck's in the driveway. And this has been going on for like two months and it's driving me nuts. We're playing cat and mouse. I need to just pick up the phone and call him. I have his number. But I wanted to talk to him face to face and yet he's, I don't think he's avoiding me, okay? He doesn't even know I'm stopping in. But I, I'm struggling to, to get with him. There's, there's this cat and mouse thing. It's, it's, it's hard. Let me tell you tonight, seeking God is not like that. God's not hiding from you. God's not dodging you. God's not, got, not waiting for you to reach some spiritual plateau. God's not, what he is doing is he's standing ready tonight, right now. 
for you to come to him and say, God, I need this relationship. My soul is thirsty. God is waiting to be close with you. And your opportunity to seek God is now. You know, often when I talk to older people that are getting close to death, they often say similar things to me. They often lament about years of their life that were wasted not serving God. I talk to many people, and I know many of you struggle with that. You look back and you say, I wish I would have served God in those early years. I wish I would not have backslid. I wish I would not have walked away from God. And so we should listen to those that struggle with that regret. We should listen to our own lives and look back at our own regret and say, there is no time to procrastinate in our walk with God. We need to seek him now. He's ready right now. You should seek God because he is ready to enter into relationship with you right now. Let's look at number three tonight. Number three. And this is the best one, I think. Number three. God is abundant in forgiveness towards the repentant. God is abundant in forgiveness towards the repentant. Look at verse seven with me. It says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. God is abundant in forgiveness toward the repentant. Verse 7 says, for those who repent, it doesn't use the word repent here, but it is a perfect description of repentance. It is repentance is forsaking our sin. Now, God is not saying, I need you to achieve a certain level of righteousness, and then I will forgive you. It's not a matter of obtaining some level of perfection. It's a mindset of saying, I am living in sin, and I want to turn to God. The word, Look at the wording there. It says, let, let the wicked forsake his way. That word way there is the idea of his direction, his path. This is an imagery of somebody going down a path of life and saying, I am wrong. I'm on the wrong path. I'm going to God and turning around and saying, this is where I was going. And now I'm going to seek God and go down this path. Look at the wording again, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. What does that mean? Does that mean we need to clear our mind of all thinking? No, it's saying this. We need to admit that we don't have all the understanding. This is a saying, and we're going to get there. I don't want <laughs> to spoil next week, but look, uh, look at verse 8 for just a second. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. There is a humility in repentance that says, my thinking got me going this way, and I need to renew my mind by God's thinking and turn to his ways. So there is both a direction and a heart mindset repentance here. And when we turn and say, I was going this way, I want to go God's way, I was thinking this way, I want to think God's way. When we have that type of repentance, then it says that God will be merciful and he will abundantly pardon. God is ready to forgive and wipe away all of our sin. I like that word abundantly. That is the image of having more than enough. I think of Thanksgiving dinner myself. I'm a food guy. I think when, you know that feeling when you're about to eat Thanksgiving dinner and you look around and I don't know about you, but I have this thought. I can eat all I want. We're not going to run out. That's abundance. There's no way I can eat all this. We are sure to have leftovers from this meal. I have no fear I'm going to run out. And yet so many Christians come to God in repentance and then they fear. I don't know if God will forgive me for what I did here. I know God will forgive me for most of the stuff. But I did something really bad back in whatever. And there's, there's 
there's hesitancy that God will accept us because of something we did in the past. And God is saying, listen, I will abundantly pardon you. God has pardon. He has forgiveness for you. And he has plenty to forgive you for whatever you have done. God forgave Paul for murdering Christians before he was saved. God forgave Peter for denying him after Peter was saved. God forgave David, as was mentioned in this passage, for committing adultery and murder after David was saved. Now, we're not recommending or, or downplaying sin, but God's mercy is greater. His grace is greater. And I don't care what you've done or when you did it. If you run to God in, in repentance, God will pardon you and forgive you. What a blessing that is. That separates him from us. Because I think all of us here, we have a limit to our forgiveness if we are honest, don't we? And we shouldn't. We should try to be like Christ. But as humans, in our flesh at least, we say, I'll forgive you for this. I'll forgive you for this. But I'm not going any further. You go too many times or you go further. That's all of the forgiveness I have. And God says, I'm standing here ready to abundantly pardon you for whatever. God says, acknowledge your sin. Seek me and I have abundant pardon for you. This is why the book of Romans can say confidently, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anybody, because there's no person that sins so great that God cannot forgive them. What an awesome God that is. Praise God for his forgiveness. You should seek God because he is ready to forgive. He will abundantly forgive pardon. Maybe you're here tonight and you aren't saved. I don't know your heart. I think on a Sunday night, chances are most of you are saved. Most of you have been forgiven of your sins, but I never want to fully assume that in a room this size with this many people. Maybe you're here and you're not saved. God is standing ready to save you. Maybe you're here and you're in a backslid condition or you've not been walking with God. Your communion with the Lord has been broken Christian, if that's, your, if that's your condition, you are a child of God, but your communion is broken with the Lord. He stands ready to forgive you and restore fellowship with you right now. Praise the Lord for that. So I want to ask as we close tonight, is your soul thirsty? Maybe you're thirsting tonight for a deeper walk with the Lord. Maybe you are thirsting for peace and satisfaction. Maybe you're thirsting for rest. Let me tell you what God is saying to us tonight. The only place you're going to find it, the only chance you have of any of that is seeking a close relationship with God. And that's where he will give us satisfaction. You can't find it anywhere else. He will enter a close relationship with you. He will forgive all your sins, no matter what you've done. So let me just challenge you, whether you're saved or lost, we all need to seek God. Let me just close. Let's get a little more practical as we close. I always want to be practical in my preaching. How do we do this? We're talking all night, the last 25, 30 minutes here about seeking God. How do we do this practice, practically? Well, it's not difficult, but it's going to require you to dedicate extensive time to prayer. Repentant prayer. And I'm not talking about a five-minute, three-minute, two-minute prayer. I'm talking about sacrifice your schedule and sit down with God and pour out your heart to God and say, God, I'm thirsty for you. God, I've sinned. O open your heart and think about how you have sinned. Ask for forgiveness. Confess your areas of sin. Repent, those, repent of those. Turn to God and say, God, help me. And I'm talking to believers now. I'm talking to believers. Spend time with the Lord in communion and pour your heart out to him. That is how we seek him. And then when you've spent time talking to him, you need to spend some time listening to him. Right here. 
right here. That is how we seek God. I want to read one more verse to us as we wrap up tonight from James chapter 4. Verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. All of us, every Christian, has seasons where we wander from the Lord in our heart, in communion, in fellowship. And that is when the discouragement creeps in. That is when our soul gets thirsty. And that is when God is calling us back. And we need to take time and pray. Take time and repent. Take time and get into the word. And God says, if we'll draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to you. God's not standing there saying, no, 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 no. You've done this too many times. No, 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 you've messed up. He's saying, come. I will abundantly pardon. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this reminder. Lord, even as Christians, we grow complacent. Our hearts grow cold. We get distracted. We get discouraged. Lord, I pray for the believers in this room, Lord. My fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we are your children, but that doesn't mean that we haven't wandered from fellowship with you. Lord, remind us tonight that what we need... And what we want is found only in close relationship with you. Lord, break our hearts. Help us to identify sin in our lives as James chapter 4 says. Help us to cleanse our hands and purify our hearts. But to draw nigh to you. To seek you. To eat that which is good from you that satisfies Lord, I pray tonight if there's a lost person here that doesn't know you, Lord, this probably hasn't made a lot of sense to them. But I pray if there's a person here that has never sought you in saving repentance and faith, that they would do that tonight. That they could know for sure they've been forgiven and adopted as your child. Lord, thank you for being a God who saves. Lord, you don't just give us a ticket to heaven. You want to walk with us every day. Lord, help us to seek you while you may be found. Bless this invitation time. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. We're going to pray in a moment. The piano is going to play. I don't know where your heart is. I don't know where your walk with the Lord is. We all go through seasons and days and weeks of struggle. But tonight is a reminder that we all need to be seeking the Lord daily. And so tonight is an opportunity to pray and say, God, help me to draw nigh to you. Help me to seek you and to find satisfaction and peace and joy in you, Father. Take some time as the piano plays and seek the Lord even right now.